Today on Lockdown Red Wings, what to expect from Eric Gustafson and what the heck happened to the Jacob Truba trade. We're going to break that all down with John Chick of the Locked On New York Rangers. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. Today, we are pleased to be joined by John Chick of Locked On New York Rangers. Uh, This is something that, John, you and I were DMing back and forth about for probably about a month now. Ever since the news of Jacob Truba potentially coming to Detroit broke, we were like, oh, when that trade happens, let's do a crossover. Well, that doesn't seem like it's happening now, but we can still talk about that. Uh, as well as the fact that Eric Gustafson is now a Detroit Red Wing. He came from the Rangers, and you know how every single player on this team is post-deadline 2023 New York Ranger material as well, with Patrick Kane, Tarasenko the year prior with Andrew Kopp. There's a lot of Rangers, so there's a lot of players we can talk about. Also, of course, 2020 draft, you got Lafreniere, you got Raymond. So this is going to be a really fun conversation to have here in the offseason. And uh, first and foremost, how are you doing? And thanks for have, uh, coming on with us. I'm doing great, man, and thanks for having me. It's always fun, you know, teaming up with you guys for these uh, fun-filled crossover editions here. And, yeah, man, just kind of going through the offseason, talking about the Ranger draft picks and everything they did and did not do in free agency. And, of course, uh, spent a considerable amount of time on the whole uh, Jacob Truba situation. But, as you said, we'll get to that in uh, in due time today. I'm sure that's been a blast for you to just con- constantly have to talk about with your fan base time and time again. Kind of like for us talking about Cider and Raymond extensions constantly. It's just like that one thing that is going to make or break the offseason, and it's not done yet, so you got to just constantly be churning out content regarding it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's always there. You know, it, it's one of those things that's kind of lingering. And as we were talking about, you know, before we even hit record here, that thing with Jacob Truba, I don't see it happening now. I mean, I, I guess never say never, but if they were going to move him, the time to do it would have been before free agency even started. And, um... You know, you can then put that cap space towards signing this guy, trading for that guy, doing whatever you want to do. But um, at this point, you know, all the big freedoms are gone. So not a whole lot of sense in making it happen now. Right. Yeah. What's what's the point at this point? <laughs> like Literally, like what is what what is the point of doing it? You know, as you are, August is right around the corner. August is what, a week away, a little over a week. Like I, I don't think and that's obviously something that's been a high point of conversation for both of our fan bases, but I really, I'm with you. I I really don't think there was a solid two, three days where I was like, okay, it's just a matter of when, like it's going to happen. And now I, I guess it still makes sense from the wings perspective. If they can upgrade their, their second pair, then they should probably consider that. But I, I don't know. I don't understand the incentive behind the Rangers doing it at the end of July or even into August. Yeah, I don't really either. And honestly, their whole approach to the whole thing was very strange. And, you know, I've talked about on my show that at this time, even now, it feels like we're on chapter three of a 10 chapter book. It feels like there's still more questions than answers surrounding the whole thing. Now, obviously, Truba's full no move clause went to a 15 team no move clause this offseason. But the weird thing to me is that, you know, the Rangers before Truba's 15 team list was due, they, you know, I guess leaked the story that. They were looking to finalize that deal with the Red Wings of sending Truba there. And my question there at the time and still now is, okay, if you're going to do that, why would you like make that known? Why would you let Jacob Truba know about that? Because wouldn't it make more sense to just wait for him to do his no trade list? And then, oh, hey, Detroit's not here. We can just do the trade. And if Detroit is on the list, then maybe you try to talk him, you know, into waiving the no move clause anyway. But once they did that, it's like, well, if I'm Jacob Truba and I don't want to be traded, I know one of the teams that I'm going to put on that list, and it's going to be the Detroit Red Wings. And um, those lists are never made public, but I would be shocked if um, Detroit wasn't one of those teams that's on the list at this point. Yeah, the whole thing is crazy. And I got a little bit ahead of myself. I do want to talk Jacob Truba first and foremost, but I have to say that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel today, FanDuel.com today to get started. Got a little ahead of myself. That's my fault. Um, but John, talking about the the Jacob Truba thing, right? Like it, it just the whole situation is bizarre. And like I want to back up a little bit because 
you know, Jacob Truba is, and I'm sure you know, kind of a, I don't want to say controversial figure, like that's kind of a strong word to use, but people always associate him with like a dirty player because he's a tall guy who hits with his elbows flared out at times. Uh, wasn't it wasn't Jacob Trubel also the guy who like slashed the guy in the head earlier in the season with his stick? Trent Frederick, yeah, he um that one I'll actually defend Truba and, and let me say Truba certainly uh, to your point, Brian, he toes the line between you know what's right. clean and what's not. There's times where people go after him and I think yeah, you know what that was not a good hit and maybe it is suspension worthy. There's other times where people uh, have you know issues. That specific one with Frederick. If you watch the replay, it does. It's during a stoppage. It looks like he's off balance. He's falling backwards. Now he absolutely meant to slash Frederick, but he's kind of falling backwards, and I think that causes his stick to go a little higher than he wanted, and that's where you know hits him in the side of the head. So that one, I'll defend him a little bit. I can buy it there. There's been some other things over the years though where I have not defended, it, and I said that's not a good hit, and um, he probably should face some some you know discipline for it. And so that leads me to my question here is, you know, why is the why were the Rangers looking to trade Jacob Truba, who is a strong right side D-man, who is your captain, and as much as we joke about how the Marc Messier Award is given out, is the Marc Messier, Marc Messier Leadership Award winner this past year. Like, what has changed since when he came over from Winnipeg until now, where the Rangers are looking at him and going, we got to move this guy? Yeah, it's a combination of things. I think, uh, first and foremost, you have to start with the $8 million cap hit. There's a lot of Ranger fans that really like Jacob Truba. I've seen some Ranger fans that say that he's their favorite player. And, hey, I, I respect everyone's opinion. There's a lot of people that really appreciate the things he does, blocking all these shots, uh, playing old school hockey, you know, establishing a physical presence for the Rangers. But there's nobody that can look at what he did this season, and especially in the playoffs, and look me in the eyes and tell me that dude is worth $8 million a year. There's just no way. I I'm just not buying it. Um, and, and, you know, people will talk about the physicality and the grit and the toughness that shouldn't cost you $8 million a year. There's a lot of tough physical guys in the league that are making significantly less than that. On top of that, uh, I touched on it just a second ago there, but the postseason performance, it was just unacceptable. Just penalty after penalty after penalty, all kinds of turnovers. Um, the, the game four overtime winner, you know, the Panthers were on the power play, um, in the Eastern conference final, but Truba completely took himself out of the play. Uh, there was a goal that they gave up in game six that was completely on him as well. Again, just taking himself out of the play for no real reason. And I think one other thing that probably doesn't get talked about as much as it should, I mean, Ranger fans, you know, are aware of this, but, you know, general hockey fans might not be as aware. Uh, the emergence of Braden Schneider. Braden Schneider has really stepped up for the Rangers. Good young player. Um, you know, just recently, he was an RFA, just recently signed a bridge deal. And, um, you know, his emergence makes Truba all the more expendable because you look at the right side, Adam Fox is going to be your top pair of D-man on the right side. Um, and, and then Schneider more than capable. And they made that switch during the season and during the playoffs of handling the second pairing. So now you've got Jacob Truba, $8 million third pair defenseman. I mean, how many third pair defensemen are making that much? A lot of them are in the six figures or the low seven figures. So I really think it's a combination of things. And I think um, for all those reasons, they were comfortable, you know, trying to move on from him, even though it did not ultimately uh, happen. If they were at some point to move on from him, uh, this is like a super general question. So if you don't have like an exact number, that's fine. But I have a hard time believing anyone is taking his contract on fully. Like how much money, how much money are you planning on eating? Like exactly. Like, I, I guess I'm just fascinated with the whole situation, obviously, because uh, of, of the points that like Brian laid out, like he, he clearly has like some value in the locker room and, and people look up to him and whatnot. But um, it, like how, how, I guess, motivated are the Rangers to move him? Like clearly not motivated enough to get rid of him this summer, but like how, how motivated are they to get rid of him? How, like to what extremes will they go maybe looking forward to offload that money? Just because uh, again, like clearly that would do something to the locker room. I'm not sure if that's necessarily a bad thing or if it's going to be like super detrimental to lose as you put it, a third pair defenseman, probably, probably. But I, I just, I would imagine that they're going to have to eat a substantial amount of that money to be able to offload him. Yeah, um, I would think uh, there probably would be some salary retention on the part of the Rangers. I would think that um, probably, you know, the, the trade that was floated, the idea of you know Truba going to Detroit. Um, you know, the, the framework seemed to be that the Rangers would retain $2.5 million of the $8 million salary. And I will say right now, whether it's with Detroit or anybody else, um, if that's the conditions and it's one of those things where it basically is just a glorified salary dump and the Rangers 
just have to retain 2.5 million. Um, I would drive him to the airport myself. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to sound <laughs> mean here, but Truba's play just was not good enough. It was not befitting of an $8 million a year defenseman. And, you know, before free agency started, I especially would have done that because then you can go out and maybe bring in this guy, bring in that guy. Now, it is worth pointing out that, you know, next season, the Rangers have a, a decent amount of players that need to get paid. You've got Igor as a UFA, uh, Keandre Miller, Alexi Lafreniere, both RFAs, even Capo Caco. I mean, if he breaks out a little bit this year, he's an RFA too. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, there's no way Jacob Truba can be on this roster at this time next year. There, there's just no way you can hang on to Jacob Truba and lose one of those players that I just mentioned, specifically, uh, you know, Igor and Lafreniere and even Miller to a lesser extent. So, yeah, whenever it does happen, whether they, you know, they waive him, somebody claims him, or there's some kind of trade here or there, and, and there's some salary retention, um, I, I do think the Rangers will have to, you know, eat some of the money, um, have some salary retention. But uh, I do think at a certain point, it's going to be inevitable. I, I just don't see any way, even if the salary cap increases next offseason, that the Rangers can afford to, to keep him on the roster when they need that money for their more important things. Awesome. Uh, let's go to a quick break here. And when we return, I want to switch and turn our eyes to Eric Gustafson, newly anointed Detroit Red Wing. The ink isn't even dry on the contract yet. Let's talk about him next and the role that he played with the Rangers and what we can expect from him on this crossover episode of Lockdown Red Wings and Lockdown New York Rangers. I love sports, and I love it so much I never want them to stop. Baseball's still ongoing, but everything else right now is kind of in a lull. So, but you can go to FanDuel, and they let you keep the sports going whenever you want. All you got to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime you're in the mood. And this this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boat boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone, every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel.com, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Segment two, Locked On Red Wings, Locked On New York Rangers crossover episode. I want to talk about Eric Gustafson now, John. Uh, here in Detroit, we kind of have an idea in our head that like he's kind of a, a Gostas Bear light. He, he's meant to replace Shane Gostas Bear um, as a power play merchant. But I want to ask you, like on the New York Rangers, how was he utilized and what can we expect of him? Yeah, so Gustafson, when he was with the Rangers, was, and it's only one year, um, but he was very strictly the number six defenseman and was always out there on the third pairing. Began the season with Braden Schneider, and then, of course, uh, we talked about Truba a minute ago. Truba and Schneider flip flops, so there was a time he was out there with Jacob Truba as well. And uh, I'd never really heard him compared to Gossis there before, but I, I do think that analogy definitely works. You know, they're both known as offensive defensemen and guys that can help on the power play. And I feel like I personally liked Eric Gustafson more than most Ranger fans did. You know, he got off to a really strong start this year. And man, when when Adam Fox got injured and missed, uh, I think it was about a month, give or take, um, he stepped up in a major way. All of a sudden, he's quarterbacking the top power play unit. They didn't miss a beat. Um, he was also seeing more ice time, obviously, and, and playing a little bit with Lindgren on the top pairing for the time being, if I'm remembering that correctly. Did a nice job there as well. As the season went on, though, you know, you do start to see – why he's been on so many teams in such a short amount of time. I mean, if you look at, he, he's a great player for, you know, immaculate grid. Cause it feels like he's played for just about every player in the, every team in the NHL. Um, but yeah, you know, second half of the season toward the end, maybe even in the playoffs a little bit, you do see him start to struggle a little bit defensively. Um, there's times where, you know, him, whether he's out there with Schneider or true, they would get pinned in their own zone uh, a little bit, but you know, for the most part, I liked what the Rangers got from Eric Gustafson. I, I, you know, people got on him a lot, and I'm thinking, like, dude, this is your number six defenseman making, like, 850K a year. Like, you're not expecting him to be a Norris Trophy candidate, you know? So, um, overall, I think he did good. I know a lot of Ranger fans really like Zach Jones, and I do, too. And there were some people that wanted to see him sub into the lineup in place of Gustafson. But, yeah, man, I mean, you're getting somebody that can quarterback a power play and really know what he's doing there. And I think if you limit him to being on the third pair and he gets, you know, the appropriate amount of ice time per night, I, I think he'll do well there. He's not somebody that's going to be on the ice at the end of a game. If you're up by a goal, you know, you've got other defense and you'll go to uh, before him, you know, if, like there's just like a minute or two left. You're trying to protect a one goal lead. Um, he's not going to be out there, but overall, you know, for somebody that it looks like for you guys would probably be on the third pair. I mean, I, I don't know that for sure, but uh, I think he'll do just fine in that role. Yeah, no, he's uh, he, he's definitely third pair. And then we actually our, our episode yesterday was <clears throat> breaking down the uh, the special teams and we both have him on power play too. 
with Cider, obviously, on uh, on power play one. I, I think the the biggest question, and we don't have to spend too much more time on Gustafson, but uh, like the, the biggest question when they acquired him was because everybody is comparing him to Ghost. Uh, Ghost was what fifth or sixth on our entire team in points. Like he was uh, <clears throat> really high up there, quarterbacking a lot of the offense, but. Ghost was one of the worst defensive defensemen I've ever seen. And he was like, his deployment was strictly offensive zone and power play because they literally could not afford to have him on the ice when the puck was in the Red Wing zone. So I think the the question that people have when they brought him in was like, okay, this guy's clearly replacing that role to an extent, right? He's clearly going to be a quarterback type of player and drive offense and, and be on a power play and whatnot. But is he like that horrible defensively too, or is it at least? And I'm not asking you to compare him exactly to like Gostas Bear specifically, but just in general, like is it is it another like okay, we got an offensive defenseman, but he's a complete liability, or is there at least, as you put it, like he was able to step up and, and provide something on the defensive side of the puck as well? Yeah, could he I hold his own? At least, <laughs> I, I, I think he at least holds his own defensively. I mean, he's certainly not elite and. You know, as I touched on a second ago, known more as an offensive defenseman. And when you spend an right. entire season with him, you do see why. But I never saw him as like this massive liability for the Rangers. I, I think he did OK. And um, he'll give you enough there. I mean, the way you're describing Gosta Spear, I, he's clearly not at that bottom of a level. And right. over, over the years, I've seen some bad Ranger defensemen. I don't think Gustafson was a bad Ranger defense. And there were guys out there that you had to hold your breath every time they were on the ice. It felt like they were a complete liability. You know, um, Patrick Nemeth a few years ago definitely comes to mind. They had Jack Red Johnson. Wings legend. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, a lot of those players you're thinking of, I think, are Red Wings, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, J- uh, Jared Tenorti was here for a little while. Like, just really random players. It's like, man, like, I, I, I hold my breath every time they're out there. I never got to that point with, Gust- uh, with um, Gustafson. So, um, yeah, definitely better in the offensive end of the game, but I don't think a tremendous liability defensively either. Well, then that leads me to, you know, my next question, too, regarding the New York Rangers. Now, with the departures that they've made and who they've brought in, what is the expectation for this year? And if the expectation is what I think it is, how long do the Rangers have to meet that expectation? Yeah, so obviously, you know, you come off a season where you're in the Eastern Conference Final for the second time in three years, and you win the President's Trophy, and Look, they had a shot. You know, there's Ranger fans that are really dramatic and act like, you know, they weren't even in the series. They were in overtime in game four with the Panthers. If they score that goal, they are up three games to one in the Eastern Conference final. And at that point, who knows what happens? So um, fine line between winning and losing in the playoffs. I really do think that's true. And I always feel like the number one reason a team doesn't win the cup is because it's really freaking hard to do. And there's 31 other teams in the league. Um, But with all that said, yeah, the window, I mean, I feel like they're going to have with this core group of players, Probably at least two more cracks at it, two more seasons. That's how long our Temi Panarin is signed for. And then all the other key pieces, you know, whether it's Adam Fox or uh, Kreider, Mika Zibanejad, Trocek, all these guys are signed long term, you know, through the next, you know, bunch of seasons. So uh, they're they're going to be there. Um, I, I think they'll be in the mix. And, you know, you even look at guys like Lafreniere. I think eventually they'll do a long term contract with him. And we saw him really come into his own uh, this past season. They've got some. Young, exciting players that seem like they're ready. You know, guys like Brian Offman, maybe Brett Berard as well. Um, Will Cooley, I think, might have a bigger role this season after an impressive rookie season. So, yeah, you know, I, I feel like um, you know the window should be open for them to win a cup in at least the next two seasons. And uh, after that, you know, we'll kind of cross that bridge when we get there. I, when Panarin, when his contract comes up, I wouldn't be surprised to see him leave. But they've got two more seasons of him and a uh, phenomenal season for him this past year. So, yeah, man, I, I think at least two more cracks is is, uh, is definitely um, is definitely about right. Fantastic. Uh, John, we're going to head to another quick break here on our little crossover, and then we're going to finish off. I want to ask you then how you feel, what you feel the Red Wings may need yes. and whatever questions you may have for us. And then we'll finish off talking a little bit of Lafreniere versus Lucas Raymond, because we all know people love to revisit the 2020 draft because, well, let's face it, the Red Wings got screwed. And so we're vindic- vindictive about it. Uh, so stay tuned to Locked on Red Wings. Segment three, crossover episode between Locked On Red Wings and Locked On New York Rangers. Um, Scotty, I believe you're up next. You haven't asked a question in a minute. You know, me, I ramble. So go ahead, buddy. It's all right, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, well, I do want to get into 
the comparison of the maybe comparison is not the right word, but just the the status of where both of these teams are at. Obviously, Brian had asked you about expectations before. I actually want to like kind of zoom out and take a look back uh, a few years and like when the Rangers won the lottery and and got Lafaniere, the future of the Rangers looked incredibly bright. And it was, you know, like, oh, look at this. You know, you can kind of see the young core forming. They just got this, like, believed to be can't miss prospect at the top of the draft, et cetera. And then even despite, and like you said, he came into his own last year. I'm, I promise I'm not trying to throw shade on him, but like he got off to a slower start, right? And yet the Rangers continued to grow around him and continued to be, uh, you know, like reach that, you know, potential that a lot of people thought. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with Igor as well. Just I, I want you to to really kind of, uh, I don't know if explain is the right word, but just kind of point out what the biggest, I guess, pillars of the Rangers have been for the last three or four years. And the reason why, despite maybe a, a slower start from Lafaniere, they still were able to become this team that's going to be a perennial cup contender for the foreseeable future. They're still young. Like they still have, like you said, I mean, a lot of their core is even still RFAs. So um, really exciting times, I think, in Rangers land. It's just what what got them here. And then also in your eyes, what do you still need to get over the hump as well? Yeah, it's funny. Like people will, you know, again, the dramatic Ranger fans will try to make it sound like, oh, they missed their window and this and that. They've got like one forward who's older than 32. Right. Like this is not an old team <laughs> in the slightest. It might feel that way because they've all been here a while, but it's still a relatively young team. But as far as answering your question, I mean, any, you know, topic like this, it has to begin with Igor Shesterkin because I think, you know, Gerard Gallant's first year when the Rangers unexpectedly made the playoffs, unexpectedly made it to the Eastern Conference Final, Igor could cover up a lot of the Ranger deficiencies and did that a lot that year. Uh, there were games that the Rangers won where, I mean, he should have been the first, second, and third star. You know, there, there were right. games where he would go out there and just do ridiculous things and be basically the only reason why they would win the game. And then, you know, they start winning, and I, I think, you know, you start getting that winning feeling and your confidence grows a little bit, and you know, hey, you know, we've got our backbone back there. He's got our back, and that's when you start to see players – uh, come into their own. But yeah, they've just done a lot of good things over the years. I mean, between the previous GM, Jeff Gordon, the current GM, Chris Jury, there's been more hits than misses when it comes to trades that they've done, um, free agent signings, drafts. I, I think all those things have really kind of added up. Um, you know, you uh, you sign Artemi Panarin in free agency and he becomes, you know, a pillar of this Ranger team. And, you know, you have your homegrown players that have had, you know, varying degrees of success, but Alexi Lafreniere coming into his own, uh, the defensemen, you know, a lot of the defensemen are homegrown. Brayden Schrader and Keandre Miller, that could be your second pairing going into this next year. And then, um, you know, just good free agent signings again. You know, Vincent Trocek, that was a move that was made a few years ago. And I think, you know, a couple of uh, Ranger fans were saying, you know, what, what's so special about this guy? But he's been completely irreplaceable. And um, him at, you know, 5.6 million, whatever it is. I mean, he, he's a steal at that, pri at that price at this point. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit of everything, you know. And again... They haven't been perfect. There have been a couple whiffs. Um, you know, the, the true betray doesn't really seem to be paying dividends the way they would have liked. But overall, you know, they, they have put together a heck of a team. And I'd actually like to ask you guys as well, because, you know, we've been talking about the Rangers and a couple of uh, Rangers there are now Red Wings. And, of course, the true betrayed that never happened. Um, but, yeah, the Red Wings, I mean, clearly they've been building up, you know, slowly but surely here and getting better and better with every year that's gone by here. I mean, playoffs have to be like a real ex realistic expectation, a realistic goal coming into this season, right? Because you know they, they barely missed it this past year, and it, it does feel like you've got a lot of players coming into their own over there. Yeah, I. It, <laughs> oh? you, you you asked a very uh, a very hot button conversation <laughs> topic there for sure. I'll, I'll try All to right. keep it brief, but it, it's. Um, I, I think if you ask a majority of the fan base, they're with you, right? Like natural progression would say that they should have their eyes set on the playoffs this year. And I think the team's eyes should be set on the postseason. Uh, the difficult part with it is, you know, when you look at what walked out of the room this year and what they brought in, I, I think Brian and I have talked about, and I think there's a few other people in the Red Wings media kind of circle that are looking around going, okay, it, different names, but I, I think the team's about where it was last season. The biggest thing that is going to, the biggest factor this season is going to be an injection of youth, I think is the expectation. Obviously, you're going to get a full season out of Edvinson, which is going to be a really big deal and hopefully bolster your second pair there. But 
there's a lot of young players that have been in the system for years now and are kind of knocking on the door. The Red Wings have one of the best farm systems in all of hockey. And so having that, you know, it's it's basically, a, a I don't want to say a guessing game, but it really comes down to how much faith you have in the youth that is going to be injected to produce at a high enough level to potentially be a playoff team in, in the NHL. I mean, that's, I don't know. I, I don't want to be like, oh, like if if they miss, it's it's uh, you know, like okay, because I I think you know you just put up a what ninety one point season. I, I think it's it's natural to, and Iserman has has gotten he has improved every year of his tenure has been better than the last. So I, I think it's natural and very okay for everybody to say, hey, playoffs is is the expectation this year. But um, at the same time, I I I think kind of being around where they were this year is, is probably a little more realistic. Yeah. And that's the, that's the really disappointing part in, in one sense, because of the fact that like we as Red Wings fans first want them to make that step forward into the playoffs, but this was what a record low amount of points to clinch a wild card spot in NHL history, at least in this format. And now you're going to have to, it's probably going to go back up again. So now you need the Red Wings to take a step forward points wise and as Scotty put it, like they're gonna be, they're gonna be leaning on youth to make up for a lot of the depth scoring that they lost, and that's not impossible. But a lot of times when you bring introduce more young players in a lineup, sometimes they go through ebbs and flows in their first season as they're getting like Lucas Raymond, for example, had 57 points his rookie season with the Detroit Red Wings. But in the second half of that year, his scoring place pace really slowed down as he adjusted to a full 82 <laughs> game season. Like it's, it's hard to ask for you and the youth has to come here. So like we're, we're in favor of the youth and the pipeline starting to make a huge, making an impact on the roster. Cause that's how you build contenders is through your own draft. And so we're in favor of it. But like we're also recognizing too that a lot of depth scoring walked out of the locker room this year, and that was by design. Like going into last year, the Red Wings had putrid scoring, so si or Iserman signed a bunch of depth scores to try and bolster the scoring that worked, except that made them horribly defensively, or horrible defensively. And so this offseason is like, okay, that doesn't work. Turn it going full Buffalo Sabers doesn't work to make you go to the playoffs. In fact, they didn't make the playoffs for a lot of the similar reasons the Buffalo Sabers missed the year prior, right? Class cannon offense. You know, it's either five goals or giving up five goals. It was no in between. And so he decided this year, he's like, okay, we got to make this team better defensively. So like they got better defensively for sure. But at the cost of letting goals walk out the door, and the question then becomes is, will that make you better? We're not sure. We think it's the right direction for the team to head, but I don't know if it's going to make the team better enough to make it into the playoffs this year, which is disappointing because we want them to make the playoffs. We right. want them desperately to make the playoffs. Yeah, there's, but there's, we all, yeah. unfortunately, progress isn't linear. Sometimes you take a small step back to take a step forward. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Red Wings this year actually step back to like 88 points rather than go forward to like 96 because you have a mix of new, a new t type of roster, right? A more defensively minded roster, which would hypothetically fit Derek Lalonde's system. He wants to be a defensive minded coach. So you could see more than marginal improvements based on that more, you know, coalescence between the two, uh, coalescence between the two rather. Um, but also, you know, you also, you need the youth to really help fill in the gaps. So it's, it's a huge question, Mark, John, and that's a, between the two of us, that's a long rambly answer just to say, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool, man. Hey, look, it's it's kind of it's fun being in that spot when you are getting better and you are improving. And I mean, yeah, I mean, to me, kind of just looking at them without going through the whole Eastern Conference, it kind of feels like they could be a little bit of a bubble team. Um, but they then are. you know, you look at some teams that made it last year, like you know, the, the Caps. Are they going to get back in? Like they're old, and I, I don't know. I, I could see the Red Wings certainly passing them, and that's all it takes. You know, you just got to get in the top half, and and you're in. But you know, you touched upon wanting to be a better defensive team. And there's somebody that's a former Ranger that's on the Red Wings that is known as a good defensive forward, but probably not producing offensively the, the way you guys would like. And that's Andrew Kopp. So just your you just want to touch an exposed nerve. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> that's what I'm doing, man. Hey, mm. man, I got to check in on my former Rangers. I love doing that. So, yeah, man. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. Kopp's had a had an interesting Red Wings 
And you're right. You know, I of the former Rangers that are on the team, I would say the the Patrick Kane experience has been much more fan uh, friendly than than the Andrew Kopp experience. Um, I. I mean, he's going to be on on like PK one, uh, like they that's you know we understand his value defensively and whatnot, but <clears throat> just hasn't even come honestly like remotely close to producing offensively what uh, what was kind of expected of him when they handed out a contract. What was that two years ago now? So I don't know. I mean, his role on the team like he's going to be a bottom six center. He's going to be the the third line center probably. Um, in that role, I think he, he's going to be like, fine. We, we, but at this point, it's not even like, oh, we're all really banking on a bounce back or, oh, can he do it? It's just like, I think we all kind of know what he is and it's, that's not going to be a very high point total. And, um, yeah, when, when the contract is up, he's certainly not going to get that amount of money again. I I think pretty safe to say. Right. And, And the really weird thing too, about like, Andrew Kopp is the year before his first year at the Detroit Red Wings. He only scored nine goals. He didn't even break double digits, the double digit goals coming off a season where he scored 20 plus, which was a career high for him. And obviously we talked before uh, you came on about how like he got a little bit of a Panarin bump when he got traded from Winnipeg, which he was already having a career year in Winnipeg. And then he got traded to a better Rangers team and put on a line with Panarin. Like that's going to help a lot. Right. Um, but he only has nine goals, but he did set a career high in points his first year with the Red Wings. He had, um, I'm sorry, not a career high in points, a second career high, the next one down in points, and the career high in assists with the Detroit Red Wings when he had 33 assists that year. So, like, his role, his performance changed from scoring goals to providing assists on the second line because I know his career high was combined, what, 50-something points between the Rangers and the Jets the year before, and then he had 42 the first year with the Detroit Red Wings. Well, this year, his he got bumped down again because the Red Wings signed JT Comfer, and now he was just straight up PK shut down line. And so his points suffered again, and he went down to 33. They didn't and even ask can't... him to produce points. They literally no. made a line where they were like, you're, you're the sh-. they called them the shutdown line. And they were like, you guys, it's, it's Fisher, Cop, and Rasmussen. You guys are just going to play defense and just don't allow goals while you're on the ice. They didn't even and, ask. They were like, Andrew Cobb, we don't even expect you to score anymore. <laughs> just like don't allow goals. Like that was literally yeah. the expectation by – that was even like by the end of the year, that was like by by American Thanksgiving. They were like, yeah, that's just your role. What about American Christmas? That's – yeah, good job, Brian. That's a, that's a callback, John. Sorry, that's an inside <laughs> joke. Uh, yeah, it, it's tough, right? Like he was good in that role. Like there, he was good as a shutdown center. Uh, he's good as a penalty killer, but you're pay- it's like the Truba conversation to start with. Where you're paying him five point six million dollars, that's not good value out of yeah. a guy you're paying five point six. So you, right. you, it's fine that that's his role, but you still need more points out of him to justify that salary, and that's just what it comes down to. Yeah, it's funny how we always have to like think in terms of the salary cap because it is so tight, and it's like we never just like judge anybody by how they're playing. It's like, well, but he's making this much, or oh, right. well, he's only making that little. But we all have to do it because it is right. it's tough to you know fit your team under the salary cap. It's, um, it is fascinating, the, yeah. the salary cap, uh, yeah. just kind of outlook of everything. I do want to, I know we got to get out of here. I do want to yeah, ask. we got to ask. I know. I got to ask about Lafayette. Um, just talk about, honestly, like, I don't even need, if you want to, like, compare him to Raymond, go for it. I'm not going to stop you, but I don't even need that. I genuinely just want, like, no, slow really start to the career. You, you've said multiple times now he really came into his own this season. Just kind of talk about his progression and why he had such a good season this year. Kind of uh, what what are the the biggest reasons that jump out to you as to why this was uh, coming into his own season? Yeah, well, we talked about the Panarin bump a little while ago there, and uh, I, I think everybody gets it. You know, anybody that plays with Artemi Panarin, yeah. you're very naturally going to see an uptick in points. Um, there was a little bit of concern of him moving from his natural left wing to right wing, but they've always kind of had an imbalance ever since he was drafted because you got Kreider, Panarin, and Lafreniere on the left side, so... To do your best top six, somebody has to change. They chose to make that Lafreniere this past season. And, I mean, he's a right winger now. Like, I don't even have to think twice about it. Like, he, he did great over there. I think, again, you know, the Panarin bump certainly helps. But also, um, something that was noticeably better this year, I, I think, certainly was his skating. It just felt like, you know, he, he was just flying out there and, you know, getting to places where he needs to be to score. Um, and I think uh, just the fact that he has Peter Laviolette as his head coach, and you know, when the Raiders hired Laviolette, I wasn't so sure how he did with you know younger players. But you go back and you look at all these different rosters that he had when he either won to the Cup or made it to the Cup Finals over the years. He had a lot of young players and a lot of guys that 
went on to great careers. Some of them are still having great careers. And I think he kind of worked his magic with Lafreniere a little bit. It felt like he had a little bit more rope did Lafreniere. Like if he had a, you know, a, a lackluster shift or two, they weren't going to like bump him down to the third or fourth line. He was going to you know keep riding with him. And he did that. And um, yeah, man, I mean, the, the shot, you know, I think came a long way. He's, he's a nasty shooter as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's, this guy's really the limit at this point. And keep in mind, you know, all those numbers that he had last year, all the points that he got, he did that while basically never playing on the top power play unit. And that might still be the case this upcoming season because they have the same five guys back for the top unit, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, again, Good problem uh, to have <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, he's, uh, anytime they're down by a goal and they, they pull the goalie, he's always the extra guy. It's the top sure. power play unit plus Lafreniere. So We'll see if they try him there this season. Maybe they need a shake up at some point during the year. I mean, the, the Ranger power play has been very good. So it's kind of one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it situations. But he's certainly capable of, uh, you know, of handling that at this point, I, w- I would say for sure. Yeah. And I think part of that, it's a similar kind of thing with Lucas Raymond this last year, right? It's just, it takes time for guys to develop. They're, they're the same age, right? Obviously, uh, Lafreniere has one extra year of NHL experience because he was the number one overall pick and immediately came into the league. But, you know, Raymond went through a sophomore slump after breaking onto the scene his rookie season. Uh, I think he finished fourth in Calder voting. That was the year Sider won the Calder. Uh, he His points took a dip, and he looked kind of overwhelmed in his second season as a Detroit Red Wing. He worked in the offseason. He developed, uh, sought, like, he gained, like, 8 to 10 pounds, depending on who you ask, in uh, the offseason because he's five foot ten, And then he gained confidence this season. Like, there were times this season where, with Larkin out, and, you, you know, uh, he was asked to be the guy. And once he realized, it's like, oh, hey, because he wants to be primarily a playmaking guy uh, historically. It's like once he realized, hey, if I shoot the puck, I can score, it was like all bets were off. So for a lot of these guys, like development is just a lot about getting your confidence underneath you, like realizing I deserve to be here. And we talked to Carter Mazur a couple of weeks ago, and that, he said the same thing about the AHL. Like he struggled in the first half of the season in the with Grand Rapids. Then like it dawned on him, it's like I deserve to be here. And that goes a long way. Yeah. So I, I, I love watching – you know, these top four picks, top five picks from that draft, because most of them, <laughs> minus Quentin Byfield, are in the Eastern Conference. So you get to see them a lot more closely and comparing and contrasting. And Lucas Freeman had a fantastic year. And he yeah. finished with 70 plus points. Byfield was another guy that started off slow and then yeah, really came into his own. Like Stutzel is really the, oh, Raymond had a, a really solid first year too, but like Stutzel was phenomenal off rip, right? And then yeah. Yeah. like everybody else has kind of had, you know, Raymond had a sophomore slump. Obviously, like I said, the first two picks kind of started off slow, but now have looked really good lately. It's it's really fascinating. That draft is going to be talked about for the next 15 years. So, yeah, um, yeah while I, I know we ran super long here, but it kind of wouldn't be a, a crossover between us without talking a little bit of uh, a little bit of, right. of Lafayette and, and Razor. We it's almost to. as if it takes young players multiple years to fully come into their own, and we shouldn't write them off just because they struggle a little bit at the beginning shocking amen to that and uh <laughs> it's crazy you know they're all still in their early 20s and right. real quick i know we've run long here but patrick kane i mean like signing him last year did you guys see that coming did you think he would stick around did you want him to stick around we can do kind of a quick version of this if you want because there were yeah, ranger fans who I, put him back and it didn't happen i think uh honestly off rip i, I we have both you know eaten our words a little bit the, the first time they signed him both of us were rather hesitant, me even more so than, than Brian. Brian kind of came around there uh, when it sounded like it was really going to happen. Um, and I, I kind of dug my heels in and I was like, I don't know how he's going to come back from this. And he did. And he was still Patrick Kane. And he obviously had a phenomenal season. And then Brian and I were of the mindset. We were like, he's not coming back. Like there, he has a market now. Somebody's going to give him two years. The Red Wings are not going to be that team. And that was wrong too. And so they, right. so I, I think I'm just going to keep predicting like bad things. Like I'm going to be like, and Oh, like doing Patrick well. Kane's going to, you know, score five goals this year and then he'll win the heart and everything will be okay. Right. But like it, it is, uh, it, it's been a wild road. We were super in favor of the re-signing. I think that's a brilliant deal. Obviously only had one year as well um, for the wings, but uh, it, it's been a, a really up and down kind of thing. But yeah, now he's, He's uh, he, he's a big piece, honestly, of what this offense in this top six hope to accomplish point production wise this season. And it's it's incredible they got him back because if they didn't, there would have been a huge hole on uh, second line wing if uh, if they weren't able to, to bring him back this season. So uh, crisis averted, really. 
Absolutely. I agree 100% with everything that Scotty just said. Uh, that being said, guys, let's wrap this up. We, as everyone's already stated, we've ran too long. John, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, give Locked On New York Rangers a listen. To our, li- to our listeners, give Locked On New York Rangers a listen. If uh, you want some good Rangers content, one of the best Locked On NHL pods out there. So, John, thank you so much for joining us, man. Thank you, guys. And any Ranger fans listening, definitely check out Locked On Detroit Red Wings. These guys are, are two of the best, no doubt about it. Awesome. We're all the best. I love to hear that. <laughs> Scotty, uh, any final thoughts? Um, I don't think so, man. We ball. Appreciate we you. We do ball. Absolutely. We'll be back with a new episode on Monday, Scotty, for Locked On Red Wings listeners. We're planning a day off tomorrow. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Same time, same place. It's your team every day. Yeah.